Let's talk about nuking the moon. That might sound like something coming way out of left field, but you also might be surprised just how much effort the United States government has put into determining how and why they might want to literally nuke the moon. In the most insane theory, there could be some kind of negative energy matter deep inside that would allow us to build futuristic spaceships and maybe even travel faster than the speed of light. This is just one of many insane things that we've learned from a recent information dump on the US government's Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program, or OSAP. A freedom of information request dating back four years has finally paid off with nearly 1,600 pages of documents and research papers released that cover some of the most fantastical aspects of space exploration. OSAP was commissioning research on traversable wormholes, stargates, negative energy, high-frequency gravitational wave communications, warp drive, dark energy, cloaking devices, and the manipulation of extra dimensions. Most of this information goes completely over my head as I am not an astrophysicist, but the article on blasting a tunnel through the moon with nukes stood out to me because it was not only understandable and practical, but also seemed like something that people might actually want to do at some point in the future, if we are curious enough, that is. So buckle in, this is going to be a weird one. This is the space race. Okay, let's try and start from the beginning. All of this crazy science fiction-esque research was created under OSAP, which we believe to be an offshoot of the rumored Pentagon UFO study known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. These were both unclassified but unpublicized investigation efforts funded by the United States government. ATIP came to the public light when the former program director, Luis Elizondo, leaked now infamous UFO videos to the press after his resignation. These are known as the Tic Tac and Gimbal videos that were recorded by US Navy airplanes and show some kind of a strange object moving on their radar screen, believed to be an alien spaceship. You've probably seen these videos before, and you've seen Elizondo as well. He's been making the rounds on History Channel conspiracy shows, Netflix documentaries, Fox News, and he even worked with Blink-182 singer Tom DeLonge on his UFO research company to the Stars Academy. You can't make this stuff up, it's glorious. Anyway, it was late 2017 when Elizondo began spilling the beans about ATIP, OSAP, and the Pentagon's apparent study of UFO activity. So instinctively, a number of journalists began filing Freedom of Information Act requests shortly after to get their hands on any government documents that might back up all of the crazy things that this dude was talking about. It took four years for the Defense Intelligence Agency to get around to releasing their files on OSAP. That's what this 1,600-page info dump is all about. It outlines everything that OSAP was up to in the period that it operated in 2008 and 2009, and they were up to some stuff. Here's what we can gather. OSAP was initiated by Democratic Senator Harry Reid. He was the Senate Majority Leader at the time and secured funding for the program under the umbrella of the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA. The work done for OSAP was contracted out exclusively to Bigelow Aerospace who was the sole bidder on that contract, meaning they were either the only company interested or the only company that knew about it. I would assume the latter, because Harry Reid and Robert Bigelow were known to be close friends and each has their own connection to UFOs and the paranormal. Reid was the senator for his home state of Nevada, home to the top secret Air Force facility known as Area 51, rumored to be the US government's storage facility for recovered alien spacecrafts. Coincidence? Maybe. Robert Bigelow was the millionaire head of an aerospace company, but also an avid believer in UFOs and alien encounters on Earth. In 1992, he established the Bigelow Foundation to pursue his UFO research and collaborated with Bob Lazar, a well-known scientist among the UFO community, who claimed to have worked on reverse engineering recovered extraterrestrial crafts at Area 51. Is that a coincidence? Maybe. 
Bigelow was also the owner of the Utah paranormal site known as Skinwalker Ranch during the same period that OSAP was in operation. Skinwalker Ranch has been linked to UFO sightings, shape-shifting animals, interdimensional gateways, and cattle mutilations. Senator Reid offered Bigelow $10 million in 2008 to spend one year researching advanced aerospace technologies and future space exploration possibilities. That contract was extended into a second year for an additional $12 million, and that's how we ended up with these extremely thorough and detailed reports on everything from warp drive to stargates to nuking a hole in the moon in order to recover the negative energy matter inside. So this plan is outlined in one of the 37 Defense Intelligence Reference Documents, or DIRDs, that were released under Freedom of Information. This one is titled Negative Mass Propulsion. The idea here is that there is a negative mass in our universe that is hidden behind the positive mass. And this phenomenon is of interest to aerospace propulsion because by adding negative mass to an object, like a spaceship, you would reduce its inertia and therefore it would become easier to set in motion. These scientists theorized that we could separate negative matter from positive matter by either generating a super powerful electromagnetic or gravitational field on our own, which would be impossible, or by searching out a place in the universe where a natural gravitational well has already created this separation of negative and positive, where we should be able to mine the negative mass specifically. So we need a place in the universe with a large gravitational well to find accumulations of this negative mass. The center of the galaxy would be an ideal location, as this would be the strongest gravitational well, but that's a bit outside the realm of possibility. The core of the sun would be another strong candidate, but we're not sure how to get in there. We have a gravitational well in the core of our own planet, of course, though I'm sure we can all agree that blasting a giant tunnel into the center of the Earth would be suboptimal. So that leaves us with our next best and most accessible candidate, the gravity well in the center of the moon. Authors of the DIRD theorized that the potential well is not too deep that it cannot be reached by making a tunnel through the moon, and that making a tunnel through the moon, provided there is actually a good supply of negative mass in there, could revolutionize interstellar spaceflight. They propose that a sequence of thermonuclear charges would be required to make such a tunnel technically feasible. What follows is about 30 pages of equations in astrophysics that I am powerless to understand, but things come back together on page 31 under the heading, The Cusp Slash Core Problem in Galactic Halos. This is where we get back into discussing the existence of this negative matter. We know that there are voids that exist between galaxies. Our universe isn't one dense cloud, it's a series of galaxies all inside their own little bubbles, with seemingly nothing in between them. Why is that? Maybe the voids are full of this negative mass that actually repels all matter, both positive and negative. This would be the opposite of the galactic core, which is a concentration of positive mass that attracts all matter, both positive and negative and they theorize that it's the accumulation of the negative matter inside these gravitational wells of positive matter that actually flattens the depths of the well and creates the bottom so that the galaxy stabilizes and doesn't just continue to become infinitely more dense. So what happens in the center of a galaxy must also happen to a lesser degree in the center of the sun, the planets, the earth, and the moon. And since the moon does not have a molten core for us to contend with, then it becomes our best chance to obtain this cosmic force of negative matter. Pretty crazy, right? But this was all clearly written by some incredibly smart people, so we can probably take their word for it? Their assumption is that if appreciable amounts of this negative matter have accumulated over billions of years in the center of the moon, then it's most likely come together in the form of an ultralight material. And in theory, the center of the moon would contain a form of matter that is 100,000 times lighter than steel, but still retains the same strength as steel. That's what we're after. That's what makes nuking a giant hole in the moon potentially worthwhile. This insane, super light, yet also super strong material that we could in turn use to build super light spaceships that would be in turn capable of super fast travel thanks to their negative mass. 
Let's try and apply that to something more based in reality. The SpaceX Starship Super Heavy just happens to be a great example of a steel spaceship. The dry mass of the fully stacked Starship is about 440,000 pounds. What if we could reduce the weight by 100,000 times? That would make the world's largest and most powerful rocket ever built just about 440 pounds. A very strong person would be able to pick it up like the Incredible Hulk, and if you were able to apply the same force of propulsion as the existing Starship, it could move 100,000 times faster. Now that's an oversimplification, of course, but that's the gist of this theory. And that is it, it's just a theory. We could end up blasting a giant thermonuclear tunnel into the core of the moon, only to discover that there is none of this negative mass super material in there at all. Or maybe just a very small amount that isn't really useful for anything. That would be pretty embarrassing and a bit difficult to explain. The government would definitely have some egg on its face. So we probably won't do that, but it is still fun to think about. I mean, this wasn't even the first time that the United States government had considered nuking the moon. They actually have a history with this idea. Back in 1957, during the early days of the space race, the US government was not faring so well against their Russian competition. The Soviet Union had just launched the first ever satellite into orbit around the Earth, Sputnik 1, and the word on the street was that the Soviets would follow that up by launching a nuclear bomb to the surface of the moon. At this point, the Americans were freaking out. They couldn't let the Soviets be the first to nuke the moon, so therefore America had to do it themselves. This is the mindset that our world leaders were in 70 years ago. It truly is a miracle that we still exist at all. So a team of highly skilled engineers and scientists were assembled to devise a plan to nuke the moon. This included such notable minds as Gerard Kuiper, the astronomer of whom the belt of matter that surrounds our solar system is named, and more recently Amazon's project Kuiper Satellite Constellation. So he was a pretty big deal. Along with him came a young astrophysicist named Carl Sagan, the future host of the Cosmos TV show and one of the most influential human beings of the 20th century. His first real job was to calculate the practical effects of nuking the moon. You can't make this stuff up. Basically, what they concluded was that because there is no atmosphere on the moon, there would be no giant mushroom cloud effect from detonating the nuke. But instead, there would be a giant pillar of radiated dust and moon rock blasted up into the vacuum of space. This pleased the US government officials because the most important part of nuking the moon was that everyone on Earth would see it happen. If not, then why bother? Luckily for all of us, at some point in the study, the researchers decided to conduct a public opinion poll to determine if people would actually want to see the moon get nuked. And since this was still the 1950s and the memory of not one, but two actual nuclear bombs going off in populated cities was still fresh in everyone's mind, the public wasn't as stoked about nuking the moon as their government. And then of course there was the reality that if America did nuke the moon, then the Soviets would inevitably have to follow that up by also nuking the moon, but bigger. And then the back and forth would just continue until the superpowers had either destroyed the moon or killed everyone on Earth in the process. At the conclusion of their report, the team of scientists recommended against nuking the moon, thankfully, arguing that since we hadn't been to the moon yet, it might be premature to go ahead and start blowing it up. We don't even know what we would be nuking. There could be useful things on the moon, or maybe even hidden alien life. They had no idea back then. Obviously, the US government followed the advice of the research team and did not end up nuking the moon, but it's frankly shocking to think how close we came and why we still wouldn't put it past them to try it again if the people in charge genuinely thought there would be something worthwhile in it for them, like obtaining a negative matter super material that might be trapped in the center of the moon. Anyway, that was a weird episode, but hopefully you had as much fun as we did. Let us know your thoughts on nuking the moon in the comment section below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.